Hi everyone, welcome back to your online lecture series. This video will cover chapter 9 where we will walk you through cellular respiration and fermentation. After this video, students will be able to explain the processes of energy transformation as they relate to cellular metabolism. In particular, you'll be able to describe both molecular and energetic input and output for cellular respiration, model or map the cellular organization of metabolic processes, and model or map the consequences of aerobic and anaerobic conditions to cellular respiration. So let's begin this lesson with cellular life. First recall from chapter one what we mean by life. What is life? It's difficult to define it within a simple one sentence definition. Instead, we recognize life by what living things do. Here are some of the properties associated with life. Order, energy processing, evolutionary adaptation, regulation, growth and development, response to the environment, and reproduction. We also learned the unifying themes of life, organization, information, energy and matter, interactions, and evolution. We also learned that the fundamental unit of life is the cell. So what does it take to keep the cell alive? Well, it takes a lot of work. Recall from chapter eight that work is just a transfer of energy. Living cells require energy from outside sources to do work. The work of a cell includes assembling polymers, membrane transport, moving, and reproducing among other things. Animals like us can obtain energy to do this work by feeding on other animals or photosynthetic organisms like plants. Take a look at this diagram of energy flow. It's showing two very important biochemical processes, cellular respiration and photosynthesis. Although they are two separate processes, they're still part of a cycle, the circle of life, if you will. But even life cycles have an entry and exit point. Notice that energy flows into an ecosystem as sunlight and leaves as heat. When we cover photosynthesis in the next lecture, you'll understand how sunlight gives energy here. To understand or experience heat as energy loss, just put your hand next to any warm-bodied individual or pet and you'll feel the heat emanating. The diagram also shows how the chemical elements essential to life, such as CO2, oxygen, water, and organic molecules are recycled. Photosynthesis generates oxygen and organic molecules, which are used in cellular respiration. Cellular respiration then generates CO2 and water which are then used in photosynthesis. What do we mean by organic molecules? Remember, organic means it contains carbon, and of course our main groups are the four macromolecules, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. In this particular example, we're talking about carbohydrates, specifically we'll be talking about glucose, the cells then use chemical energy stored in those organic molecules to generate ATP, which powers work in the cells. In this lecture, we're going to consider how cells harvest the chemical energy stored in organic molecules and use it to make ATP. First, we'll begin with some basic information about respiration. Recall from chapter eight, Catabolic pathways release stored energy by breaking down complex molecules. Organic compounds like carbohydrates have a type of potential energy called chemical energy as a result of the arrangement of the electrons in the bonds between their atoms. These compounds can participate in exergonic reactions and act as fuels for our body. Through the actions of enzymes, 
these compounds rich in potential energy are broken down into smaller waste products that have less energy. Electron trans transfer is going to play a major role in these pathways. We'll see more on electron transfer very shortly. These processes are central to cellular respiration. You should also remember that the breakdown of organic molecules is exergonic, meaning it is spontaneous and releases energy. Within the cell, there are various catabolic pathways that can produce ATP. We'll be talking about these four. Aerobic respiration, fermentation, anaerobic respiration, and cellular respiration. First, let's cover aerobic versus anaerobic. Aero comes from the Greek word meaning air, and aerobic means a life process relating to or requiring oxygen. Oxygen makes up about 21% of the gases in the air that we breathe. Anaerobic means the opposite, so a process that does not require oxygen. This will make more sense as we dive deeper into cellular respiration. Let's walk through these catabolic pathways. Aerobic respiration consumes organic molecules as the fuel and oxygen and yields ATP. Anaerobic respiration is similar to aerobic respiration, but consumes compounds other than oxygen. Cellular respiration includes both aerobic and anaerobic respiration, but it's, all, it's often used to refer only to aerobic respiration. In red, we see the basic formula for cellular respiration, and I'll tell you now that you will have to know this formula. C6H12O6 plus 6O2 yields 6CO2 plus 6 H2O plus energy, which comes in the form of ATP and heat. Finally, there is fermentation. Fermentation anaerobic is a partial degradation of sugars that occurs without oxygen. We'll return to these concepts as we move through the lecture. As I mentioned, electron transfer plays a major role in these pathways, particularly special types of reactions called redox reactions. Redox is short for reduction and oxidation. So a redox reaction will have both of these occurring. Redox reactions are pretty simple. In oxidation, a substance loses electrons which we call being oxidized. In reduction, a substance gains electrons, which we call being reduced, because the amount of positive charge is reduced. Here's an easy way to remember this, two mnemonics to choose from. The first is oil rig, O-I-L-R-I-G. Oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. Or, Leo the lion goes grr. Leo, loss of electrons is oxidation. Grr, gain in electrons is reduction. In every reaction, there is an exchange of electrons whereby one compound loses electrons while the other gains them, hence the term redox reaction. This transfer of electrons during chemical reactions releases the energy stored in organic molecules like sugars and fats. This released energy is ultimately used to synthesize ATP. Take a look at the general reaction formula below. We have X and Y representing reactants and E minus for the electron. X begins with the electron, so it is written X E minus. X E minus is reacted with Y, and this yields X and Y E minus. What happened here? The electron was transferred. It moved from X to Y. Now, which was oxidized and which was reduced? 
loss of electrons is oxidation. So X was oxidized because it started with the electron and lost it. So Y was reduced. Reduction is gain of electrons. This is a redox reaction. Chemical reactions that transfer electrons between reactants are called oxidation reduction reactant reactions or redox reactions. You'll also notice two other terms, reducing agent and oxidizing agent. The reducing agent is the reactant that gives the electron and becomes oxidized while the oxidizing agent is the reactant that takes the electron and becomes reduced. So it's kind of like their opposite. So let's apply the general redox reaction to cellular respiration. Take a look at the reaction below. This is the basic reaction for cellular respiration. C6H1206 plus 6O2 yields 6CO2 plus 6H2O and energy in the form of ATP and heat. Although we've changed the reactants and products from X and Y of the last slide, the same thing is occurring. Electrons are being transferred. During cellular respiration, the fuel, such as glucose, C6H12O6, is oxidized, meaning it will be broken down and lose electrons. As it is broken down and oxidized, it loses some hydrogens too, and we're left with 6CO2. On the other hand, O2, oxygen, is reduced meaning it will gain electrons and some hydrogens as well. And now we have water, 6H2O. Don't be confused by the hydrogens. Remember, electrons have negative charge. So to balance this out, H plus protons also tag along to neutralize that charge. Organic molecules with an abundance of hydrogen are excellent sources of high energy electrons. This is a glucose molecule with 12 hydrogens. In these reactions, energy is released as the electrons associated with hydrogen ions are transferred to oxygen, which has a lower energy state. I'm going to repeat that statement. In these reactions, energy is released as the electrons associated with hydrogen ions are transferred to oxygen, which has a lower energy state. What do I mean by a lower energy state? This brings back a concept from the previous lecture, free energy, delta G. Let's use this diagram to explain this. Look at part A an uncontrolled reaction of hydrogen gas and oxygen gas combining to form water, H2O. The y-axis has free energy, G, increasing in the upward direction. In order for hydrogen and oxygen to form a covalent bond, there needs to be a sharing of electrons. Oxygen has the higher electronegativity, so it is going to be pulling hydrogen's electrons towards it. Hydrogen gas and oxygen gas start off with high free energy. Again, Gibbs free energy G is the energy that can do work and cause change. The more free energy, the more unstable the system is, which just means we're going to see something happen. So in this reaction, hydrogen gas H2 and half of an oxygen gas, O2, molecule, react with each other to form H2O. During this process, energy is released. Read that statement at the top again. Energy is released as the electrons associated with hydrogen ions are transferred to oxygen because oxygen has a lower energy state. 
So is this reaction exergonic or endergonic? It's exergonic because it's releasing energy. In fact, this reaction is an explosive release of energy. Is it spontaneous or non-spontaneous? It's spontaneous because it's releasing energy. No energy input is required. What if I want to break apart the water molecule to recreate hydrogen gas and oxygen gas? This is the reverse of this reaction. It would require energy, so this is endergonic and non-spontaneous. Okay, now look at reaction B, cellular respiration. The same basic concept is happening during cellular respiration in our cells as is occurring in the uncontrolled reaction of reaction A. Hydrogens and oxygen are reacting to create water. It's just that for cellular respiration, this occurs over the course of many smaller reactions. Why? Well, maybe it's so that we don't explode every time a water molecule is created. I'm going to revisit this image later once we've learned about the electron transport chain and ATP. For now, make sure you understand the statement at the top of this slide. Energy is released as the electrons associated with hydrogen ions are transferred to oxygen, which has a lower energy state. Now look again at the formula for cellular respiration and connect it to that statement. Where are the hydrogens and electrons that we will be transferring to oxygen? They're on the organic molecules such as glucose, C6H12O6. Look at all those hydrogens. There are 12 on this glucose sugar molecule. And where do they end up? On the oxygen gas, which becomes reduced, gaining electrons and hydrogens to create water as a product. So the reaction at the top is the reaction equation of cellular respiration. But like I said, cellular respiration is not just one reaction. It's many reactions within our cell. This is just the net equation. Particularly, it's a bunch of redox reactions, which electrons are being ripped from the organic molecule C6H12O6 and passed on to molecules that have lower energy states until finally they end up on that oxygen to become water. The reaction below is one of the important redox reactions of cellular respiration. This is the reduction of NAD plus to NADH. NAD is nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. NAD has a very important role as an electron shuttle, accepting and transporting electrons within the cell. It begins as NAD+, so it has a positive charge. Notice the light blue N+, on the nicotinamide. It then gains two hydrogens supplied by the organic molecules we eat, such as C6H12O6, the glucose molecules. Remember that hydrogens have one proton and one electron each, so this is two H plus protons and two electrons. An enzyme called dehydrogenase catalyzes this reaction. In this reaction, both of the electrons are placed onto the NAD+, and only one of the hydrogens, the other one is going to be released into the cell. Now the light blue N of the nicotinamide is neutral due to the addition of an electron, and a hydrogen with its electron was added onto the ring. This NAD plus was reduced to NADH and now is acting as an electron shuttle. We'll see how these help make ATP later in the lecture. For now, just make sure that you understand its role as an electron shuttle. That NAD plus is the oxidized form because it will it has lost electrons and NADH version 
is the reduced form because it has gained two electrons and hydrogen for transport. NADH acting as an electron shuttle for two electrons being ripped from organic molecules like C6H12O6 as it's oxidized will play an important role in forming ATP. It's part of something called the electron transport chain and just notice what's at the end of this chain. Oxygen waiting to accept electrons and be reduced to become water. So to sum this all up, in cellular respiration, glucose and other organic molecules are broken down and harvested for energy in a series of steps. Electrons from organic compounds are usually first transferred to the coenzyme NAD+. Remember that a coenzyme is a non-protein compound that helps an enzyme function. As an electron acceptor, NAD plus functions as an oxidizing agent during cellular respiration. Each NADH, which is the reduced form of NAD plus, represents stored energy that will be tapped to synthesize ATP. Remember, ATP is the end goal of cellular respiration. We eat and digest organic molecules like glucose to harvest the energy within and make ATP. ATP is what our cells use for energy. Here's the diagram we analyzed earlier. NADH passes the electrons to the electron transport chain. Unlike an uncontrolled reaction, the electron transport chain passes electrons in a series of steps instead of one explosive reaction. Oxygen pulls electrons down the chain in an energy yielding tumble. The energy yielded is used to generate ATP. Okay, now you have the chemistry background for redox reactions and a basic understanding of how energy is released as the electrons associated with the hydrogen ions are transferred to oxygen, which has a lower energy state. We're ready to move on to the main event, the harvesting of energy from glucose via cellular respiration. Harvesting of energy from glucose has three stages. One, glycolysis, which breaks down glucose into two molecules of pyruvate. Two, the citric acid cycle, which completes the breakdown of glucose. Three, oxidative phosphorylation, which accounts for most of the ATP synthesis. Here is an overview of these three stages, glycolysis, citric acid cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation. We'll be referring back to this image as we move through to help piece it all together. So the first phase is glycolysis. Glycolysis means sugar splitting, glycolysis, glycolysis. Glycolysis harvests chemical energy by oxidizing glucose to pyruvate, meaning glycolysis breaks down glucose into two molecules of pyruvate. Glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm and occurs whether or not oxygen is present. Let's pause here because there's something really important you have to understand about glycolysis. Although we're discussing cellular respiration and its application for eukaryotic organisms, such as ourselves, parts of this process go way back before there were ever eukaryotes. Remember, eukaryotic cells have organelles, while prokaryotic cells do not. But prokaryotic organisms like bacteria and archaea still need energy, right? Not only do they need energy, they came first. They were the pioneers in the use of organic molecules as fuel for survival. So how did the early prokaryotes break down organic matter for energy? glycolysis. You may recall from an earlier chapter that the first living cells on earth are thought to have arisen more than 3.5 billion years ago. At that time, the environment lacked oxygen. 
but was rich in highly reduced organic materials, meaning lots of hydrogen and lots of electrons. This is the perfect fuel molecule for oxidation. Remember, energy is released as the electrons associated with hydrogen ions are transferred to something which has a lower energy state. Why did I cross out oxygen? Because there was no oxygen in this environment, so as these metabolic processes were first developing, they were using other lower energy molecules for those redox reactions. This is when early forms of fermentation developed, which includes glycolysis, we'll, we'll cover fermentation later. Even today, nearly all living organisms use glycolysis as the first step in the breakdown of glucose to extract energy for cellular metabolism. Now it should make sense why glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm and occurs whether oxygen is present or not. It evolved in the cytoplasm, or the cytosol, of prokaryotes in a world with no oxygen. So let's get into the biochemistry of glycolysis. Glycolysis has two major phases, energy investment phase and energy payoff phase. What does that mean? Let's keep in mind that the point of glycolysis is to oxidize glucose and make ATP. Unfortunately, before we gain ATP, we have to invest some. There are 10 steps in the glycolysis pathway. In the energy investment phase, which includes the first five steps, we need to pay to ATP. Then in the energy payoff phase, which includes the last five steps, we yield four total ATP, which gives us a net of two ATP from glycolysis. You may be wondering how we made four ATP when we invested two ATP. That's a good question. Let's walk through it. Here are the 10 steps of glycolysis. The five steps in the top panel are the energy investment phase, and the five steps in the bottom panel are the energy payoff phase. If you're in an intro bio course, you don't need to know all the details of these reactions. When you take biochemistry, you will. But I'm going to explain these steps because it's never good to memorize for biology. You have to seek to understand. So I'm going to explain a little more than what you'll be tested on. This way you can understand and organize the information instead of memorizing it. Of course, we begin with glucose, an organic molecule, with the formula C6H12O6. The first reaction is an investment step. We are investing an ATP here. What's happening? The enzyme hexokinase breaks apart the ATP and places a phosphate group onto the glucose. Notice that the product has the yellow phosphate group attached. This new molecule is called glucose 6-phosphate because the phosphate is on the sixth carbon of glucose. Remember from an earlier lecture how we count the carbons. Start at the oxygen present in the, the sugar ring and count clockwise. One, two, three, four, five, six. Also, just notice the names of these enzymes too. Hexokinase. A kinase is an enzyme that adds or removes a phosphate group. Hexose is a six carbon sugar molecule. Hexokinase is an enzyme that adds a phosphate group to a six carbon sugar. Step two uses the enzyme phosphoglucoisomerase. What's happening here? Remember from chapter four that an isomer is a compound with the same molecular formula, but different arrangement of atoms. We learned structural isomers, cis-trans isomers, and enantiomer, mirror images. So an isomerase is an enzyme that shuffles the arrangement of the atom. Here, glucose 6-phosphate gets cut open by phosphoglucoisomerase, and the six-member ring becomes a five-member ring. 
What happened was the oxygen in the ring reattached to carbon 2 instead of carbon 1. The product is now fructose 6-phosphate. Glucose 6-phosphate became fructose 6-phosphate. How? Remember that fructose and glucose are both 6-carbon hexoses, but fructose is a 5-member ring and glucose is a 6-member ring. So the isomerase arranged glucose into a fructose. Step three is a very important step because it's a place of regulation for the cell. We'll return to how later, but put a star next to it and note that it is used for regulation. The enzyme used here is phosphofructokinase. Notice that this is the other place of ATP energy investment. Phosphofructokinase, also called PFK, hydrolyzes the ATP and places a phosphate group onto carbon-1. The product here is then fructose 1,6-bisphosphate because fructose has two phosphate groups on carbons 1 and 6. And yes, technically they're attached to the oxygens on those carbons. In step four, aldolase cleaves fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to create glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, G3P, and dihydroxyacetone phosphate, DHAP. But only G3P can move into the next phase. So we have another isomerase enzyme in step five to convert DHAP to G3P. As I said, that's more detail than you likely need to know for Bio 1, but hopefully that process made some sense to you. The three molecules I will say to star and circle are glucose, PFK, which is phosphofructokinase, and G3P. Notice where the ATP investment is at steps one and three and how this results in the addition of a phosphate group to the reactants in this pathway. Phosphates kind of activate or supercharge molecules and allow them to do things. Next, let's see how to get the ATP payoff. Phase two of glycolysis is the energy payoff phase. Instead of adding ATP, we're going to be making it. We begin with G3P, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Notice that this organic molecule is a three carbon sugar, which we call a triose. The six carbon sugar was cleaved in half by aldolase in step four above into G3P and DHAP. In step six, G3P encounters a new type of enzyme, a dehydrogenase. These are all over the metabolic map, which is why I'm pointing it out to you. Usually when there's a dehydrogenase, it's accompanied by the formation of NADH. Looking back at this simplified tally of glycolysis, notice NADH in the energy payoff phase panel. We already learned all about the reduction of NAD plus to NADH because it acts as an electron shuttle. Well, here's the first place in cellular respiration that we make a NADH. This dehydrogenase enzyme begins with NAD plus and rips two electrons off of G3P to reduce NAD plus to NADH. As this happens, an additional phosphate group is able to be added to G3P producing 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. Notice the two phosphate groups on here now. In phase one, we needed to use ATP to add phosphate groups, which cost us energy. But here, this enzyme is able to add phosphate without using ATP. Now we can harness the chemical energy to create some ATP. In step seven, the phosphoglycerokinase enzyme cleaves off one of these high energy phosphate groups and adds it to ADP to create ATP. I'm going to skip over steps eight and nine. For reaction 10, 
the enzyme pyruvate kinase cleaves off a phosphate from phosphoenopyruvate, PEP, and the product is pyruvate. Pyruvate is a three carbon sugar. So why do we see two in front of all of these steps? Two NADH, two ATP, two ATP. Because after the first phase of glycolysis, we created two G3Ps. One thing I'm going to continue to remind you of for the rest of this lecture is to track the number of carbons. We begin with glucose, a six carbon sugar. After step five, we have two three carbon G3Ps. Each of those goes through phase two. Each G3P yields one NADH and two ATPs. But because we send both G3Ps through this, we create a total of two NADH and four ATPs. So now this tally should mean a lot more to you. In the energy investment phase, we pay two ATP and create two three carbon G3Ps. The G3Ps move through the energy payoff phase where we create two NADH and four ATP and produce two pyruvate molecules. The net gain for glycolysis is therefore glucose is oxidized to two pyruvate and two waters. Four ATP are formed, but two were used so two net ATP, two NADH molecules, and that's it. That's glycolysis. Keep in mind that this occurs in the cytoplasm of both prokaryotes and eukaryotes alike. No organelles are involved. And this is an anaerobic process. No oxygen is used. So that was a lot of work for only two ATP. As we move through, you'll see that glycolysis gives us the least bang for our buck as far as energy production is concerned. We are big complex organisms and we're going to need to be able to further oxidize the pyruvate to harvest more energy. The next step is moving the pyruvate from the cytosol into the mitochondria where the rest of cellular respiration will occur. And that wraps it up for part one of cellular respiration. See part two for the citric acid cycle, oxidative phosphorylation, the electron transport chain, and fermentation.